Hey, Tim. Hey, Aaron. I heard we had a guest today that has a project that uses IoT to bring inside uh, insects closer to home. Yeah, we're going to be talking with AWS SA Dave Malone today, and he's going to show us how he used AWS IoT, AWS IoT Greengrass, EC2, and S3 all together to help his family keep track and take care of monarch, monarch butterflies. That sounds really cool. Uh, and I heard that the work that his family is doing has earned them the designation as an official Monarch way station. So stay tuned to this episode of IoT All The Things. Special Projects Edition. I'm Erin McGill. I'm a solutions architect here at AWS. Um, I've built my career on uh, the infrastructure side of the house. I started as a sysadmin, uh, really a Jacqueline of all trades, racking and servers and data centers and, and kind of working a lot more with uh, servers in the back end and databases and networking. Um, but Recently, you know, even even though I've worked on larger IoT projects, recently I've gotten pretty interested in home experimental IoT projects. I'm really interested in the fact that I can take a piece of hardware, uh, maybe some wires and a breadboard and a little bit of code, uh, and make things actually happen in the physical world. What about you, Tim? Hey, I'm Tim, Partner Solutions Architect for IoT. I started out as an embedded software engineer and um, I've gone through application development, uh, some kernel development, a whole bunch of different things, but now I'm back at AWS and I'm working with partners in the IoT space all the time to build cool new hardware projects, software projects, platforms, everything, and I love it. Just like you said, I like writing code and having it interact with the real, real world. So it's great to have everybody back again. Uh, today we're gonna talk, as usual, about projects from edge to cloud, idea to fruition. And soon we'll bring on a guest, AWS Solutions mm -hmm. Architect, Dave Malone. Yeah, he and his uh, family have set up a safe space for monarch butterflies, uh, which is using AWS services such as IoT, Greengrass, and S3, and EC2 to watch and monitor these monarch butterflies as they go from the egg to a caterpillar to chrysalis and to butterfly. But before we get to all that, Aaron, did I tell you that I actually left the house for once? I do not believe it. Um, okay, so yeah. you actually left the house. Um, well, and you can't do things only partially way or like a normal person. So how do you actually manage to leave? <laughs> so I decided that, you know, I always have to wear a mask when I'm going outside of the house, but masks are boring. Mm -hmm. So I found masks a video so that somebody sent me. Yeah, somebody sent me this video where they took uh, an LED matrix and embedded it into the mask. And what oh. it does is as you're talking, it, uh, it has like a little mouth that moves. So I built one of those things and uh, went outside and made myself look totally weird in my neighborhood. It was awesome. <laughs> that sounds really cool. Um, before people ran away, um, <laughs> um, of because it probably looks really interesting. Um, but I really like this idea um, these days to keep everyone safe. You know, we go outside and wear masks. Um, but it's hard to, especially if you're hard of hearing, a lot of people rely on people's mouths to move and kind of in interpret the mouth moves to understand what you're saying. So maybe this could help those types of people? Yeah, potentially if you get a higher resolution display. I have it here. It's a little bit difficult to, to get on at the second, yeah. uh, but it's kind of a low resolution display. I actually modified it. I don't know if you can see this. I modified it to oh, show yeah. my name on it. Um, I just did that today and I thought, you know, in the spirit, like you said, of being able to make things more uh -huh. accessible for people, as you're wearing a mask, let's say you go to a conference, you're going to meet some people, uh, it's hard enough to remember everybody's name when you're talking to them uh, in, in person, <laughs> yeah. but when they have a mask on and you can't differentiate them necessarily as easily, I figured scrolling my name across might be a convenient way to do it. So the way that it works now is it scrolls your name across and as you're talking, it moves the mouth mm -hmm. and then it goes back to the scrolling name when you're not talking anymore. Um, so that was so, pretty fun to build. And yeah, I'm going to release code for sounds, that so everyone can check it out. It sounds really cool. So what are the components? Uh, there's only a couple of components in this. There's a, there's an eight by eight matrix of LEDs. Those are NeoPixel mm -hmm. LEDs. And <laughs> that it sounds uses cool. an art. Yeah, NeoPixels are my favorite LEDs, by the way. They're really, yeah. I have a couple yeah, of videos right. that maybe I'll show, share in a later um, 
episode where I've done a bunch of different things with them, but they're really fast to react. You can program them and, and make them react very quickly. Um, and they're just super easy to, to, um, to use in code because there's a ton of libraries to make it easy. So NeoPixel is one of the best things that you can use if you want to do LEDs, uh, whether you want to Tim, do display or Tim, why are you making me LEDs. spend more money? I don't understand. Uh, now I have to go out and yeah. obviously get myself some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll send you some links to find uh, find them in the, the best, cheapest way you can. Um, so yeah, I had worked <laughs> with those LEDs before and saw that this mm -hmm. project was using it. So I figured, let me build it. Let me see if I can change it around and play with it. So the LEDs, an Arduino mm -hmm. Nano, um, a nine volt battery, because you need a lot of power to drive the LEDs, uh, and an electric microphone, which is just a really tiny, uh, like silver can microphone that you that's on a circuit board. And a little bit of soldering, I felt like the directions weren't the best, so maybe we can improve on that. But uh, a little bit of oh, soldering yeah. and you know, maybe half an hour, I had it up and running. It was, it was really cool. So is it wearable? Like, I mean, obviously they, you want to wear it, but is it like heavy or yeah. cumbersome? It yeah, is. so right now the wires are a little bit short. So right now the, the battery is kind of right up against my face. It looks like uh, this author in Punisher <laughs> mask. I don't know if you know that band, but this guy has a really crazy mask that he wears. It looks kind of like that. Um, but <laughs> you can extend the wires out and you could you could move them somewhere else. You could put them behind your head. Maybe you could put them around your neck. Um, but the, the LEDs themselves are really, really thin. It's kind of like a sheet of paper with just some little bumps on it. So oh, it cool. doesn't really weigh that much. So with a few mods, it'd be, be wearable all the time, I think. All right, and well, now I now I have to get one or make my own or have you make me one? <laughs> I I have some spare parts. You know, uh, some of the things you have yeah. to buy in bulk. So I have spare parts left over. Maybe um, if you buy the LEDs, I'll I'll build the rest of it for you. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. Um, cool. So, speaking of the great outdoors, we have our guest today, Dave Malone. Um, so internally, we put a call out for cool side projects um, to any technologist or anyone at AWS who uh, is maybe tinkering or playing with IoT. Uh, and Dave came back with this really cool project that he and his family are working on. Uh, so let's bring Dave. Hey, Dave, welcome. Hey, Tim. Hey, Why Aaron. Us... Thanks for having me on the show today. Well, well thanks for joining thanks. us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Or yourself. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm an IoT solutions architect with AWS, and I've been with uh, AWS for about three years now. I've spent most of my career on the software side of the house, um, building and developing enterprise software, and uh, eventually getting into more and more practical, hands-on, physical uh, hardware plus software development. And um, so it's it's exciting to be able to do this at AWS. Yeah, it's where all the magic cool. happens. So yeah, for sure. And there's a lot of magic in this project. We listed, I think, four or five mm -hmm. services. Maybe there's even some that I missed. So just tell us about the project. What what, ex what exactly is it? Yeah, so the project is um, really kind of simple, but it just takes time-lapse uh, photographs and stitches them together into a time-lapse video of monarch butterflies as they're emerging from their chrysalis. Cool. So how did this and come about? What? Oh, uh, my apologies. We even have a, a little bit of a oh, yeah. time lapse uh, video sample to show. Oh, cool. Let's see it to the videotape. Awesome. All right. So talk us through what what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is pretty much the first successful capture. Um, we'll talk about the failures mm -hmm. in a minute. Um, but there are <laughs> a few failures. of these videos. Um, <laughs> yeah, where uh, we were able to actually capture uh, enough of the time-lapse footage and get the timing correct and and all of that to actually witness a, a butterfly emerging from the chrysalis. Oh, cool. I think we just saw one. And awesome. I think another one's coming up too. And so these are yeah, just so, four chrysalis. Okay. Yep. Yep. There's about three of them that are going to emerge here in these, in these three distinct videos. Oh, there we go. And is that just like a wooden board? that they're attached to? Oh, oh, there it goes. Yeah, one. yeah, <laughs> yeah, they start to move, it looks like, pretty quickly uh, due to the time-lapse yeah. nature here. Um, yeah, so this all came about because we had some, some our first group of caterpillars and chrysalis uh, that we were working with uh, were at risk in the outdoors. So we decided mm -hmm. to bring them indoors 
And throughout this process, um, credit to my wife, Sarah, uh, this was actually her project with the kids um, as you know, we are kind of adjusting to COVID and, and kids are working at home. You'll see, we went out and bought some milkweed and throughout this, uh, the first few caterpillars formed on the outside of our screen and unfortunately uh, did not do so well. So wow. Sarah went out and did some research and figured out how can she bring these safely under the cover of our lanai to give them more of a fighting chance. Um, and she was able to do that uh, using dental floss and just detaching mm -hmm. them from where they formed on their own and bringing them under the cover of our lanai. Awesome. All right, so okay, this so looks like that... we have some... Sorry, go oh, ahead, Tim. Very excited. Oh, I was going to say, this. you mentioned you brought them inside. <laughs> I was curious uh, why um, why bring them inside. You mentioned that they, they might be at risk. I'm curious what the risks are for these out in the wild. Yeah, so I guess they're a prime snack for wasps in Florida. Um, the butterfly mm -hmm. eggs themselves, once they're laid by the monarchs on the milkweed, wasps will come by and, and swoop in and eat them. Um, there's also fire ants. Uh, as you can see, this one's pretty close to the ground. So fire mm -hmm. ants can crawl up there and, and get at that uh, chrysalis and, and eat it. Um, and on top of that, this one's getting a little bit too much sun. So this one, unfortunately, didn't mm -hmm. make it. So they're just subject to all sorts of predators and, and disease. Got it. All right, so these are some of the pictures where you have them at risk, where they've attached themselves to your screens and maybe didn't make it as high as they should have uh, and are subject right. to some of those dangers. Okay. Yep, yep that's so right. Now, cool. now you bring them inside and then where does this project come in exactly? Yeah, so once we had these first few uh, chrysalis inside of our back uh, screen porch, our kids were going through uh, e-learning for the first time, um, but they're also very excited about the chrysalis emerging as yeah, butterflies. Who wouldn't right? be? So, I would be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think we all were. Um, so yeah. what we what we found though is it was too much of a distraction. The kids were running outside every few minutes looking to see if a butterfly had emerged. So I thought, well, we could solve this pretty easily with a little bit of technology, right? So I had a Raspberry Pi. Uh, with a camera lying around from a previous project. Um, so my idea was to take it and just stick it out there in front of the chrysalis and give a live video stream for the kids to look at in their browsers as they're going through their online learning. And that way they could still stay focused on school, but also not miss anything. Yeah, Got that it. sounds pretty Yeah, they can convenient. just have the window open, kind of glance at it. Yeah. That's awesome. So how did you first think that you were going to approach this problem? So originally, a solution, I, I guess. wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Originally, um, because I had this existing project uh, with Kinesis Video Streams uh, mm -hmm. to use and create a live stream uh, with my Raspberry Pi camera, that would make it fairly easily for the kid to open up a live video stream and put that in the browser. Um, that's where I kind of started. I started with this live video stream with uh, with KBS. Got it. And did you cool. did you end up doing the streaming? It seems like you know they might be stationary for for quite some time, and it might be fun to go back and forth as your kids want to run and see them in person. But I wonder if uh, if that's where it really ended up. Yeah. 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 Um, the streaming idea worked okay at first, but just like you said, Tim, there wasn't enough change, uh, noticeable change over the course of the minutes or even the days. Um, so the kids just <laughs> kind of stopped checking the video stream because nothing really new was happening. <laughs> Best laid plans. Um, so um, you didn't end up doing the streaming. What did your project actually develop into? And I think we have a diagram of what what it is right now, at least your uh, architecture. Yeah, yeah. So um, as you can see here, using a, a Raspberry Pi camera and the Raspberry Pi, uh, it changed from using Kinesis video streams into using um, AWS Greengrass plus a, a Lambda mm -hmm. function to help schedule and take automated still photos and to upload those mm -hmm. on a scheduled basis into an S3 bucket. Um, and then from there, the idea was to use an EC2 instance with uh, FFmpeg to generate the time-lapse photos uh, into a video and upload the video into a well-known 
publicly accessible uh, key. So again, the kids could just keep it open in the browser and just hit refresh every now and then to see if anything's changed in the time lapse. Um, so that's that's what it evolved into. That's very, very cool. cool. Okay. F of MPEG is near and dear to my heart. I think I spent about six <laughs> months working on a project uh, with it, and we spent <laughs> endless time tinkering with the options. It's a great piece of software. It does everything mm -hmm. you could possibly imagine, but because of that, it has a lot of options. I'm curious, um, how much time did it take you, you know, tinkering with it, or did you just have some kind of settings you found and just stuck with them? Yeah, so like any good IT professional, I started with a quick uh, <laughs> internet search and found a working <laughs> script <laughs> that just sort of worked. Um, so that's how I, I started with FFmpeg. Um, but I think, you know, my experience uh, is relatable to yours, Tim, in that as I started playing with it and I started learning more about FFmpeg, I probably spent more hours than I care to admit just learning about the features. And it is a great open source utility. Um, it's, it's worked out very well for this project. Cool. Yeah. And I know that there are some other options, you know, FFmpeg, I think they forked mm -hmm. their code off. Uh, somebody created something called AVCon, then I think VLC also has very similar features to it. And I kind of, on that previous project I was talking about, I bounced back and forth between the two. Um, did you try out any other tools or how did you, how did you finally decide that FFmpeg was the one? In my initial search, I did find a few other options, including just simply uh, using the Raspberry Pi cameras, CLI tools to capture pictures, and then um, using a combination of, of other Linux and CLIs uh, to stitch together the photos on the Raspberry Pi itself into the time-lapse video. Um, but those weren't as easy to get up and running. Um, the amount of mm. bash scripting I had to maintain felt a little clunky. Uh, the FFmpeg option just kind of came about as the easiest just works solution. Yeah, I do love me uh, some bash scripts, but <laughs> when you end up writing a whole bunch of bash scripts, which a, another tool just does natively, maybe it's time to switch back to what you already had. <laughs> uh, so um, it sounds like you went through a lot of iterations of the equipment that you're using. So can you tell us a little bit more about the cameras that you went through when you uh, during the development of this project? Yeah, so the camera um, that I'm using today uh, is, is a little bit different than the camera I started out with. Um, because I had grabbed this from a previous project that I had set up, uh, I was using what's called a no IR camera for Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. uh, which is supposed to be used in a low light setting to help you with an infrared light to actually capture images that are in a, you know, again, very low light or all dark setting. Um, I only mm -hmm. figured that out after I had my setup going for, uh, after about the first day, probably, I was able to look through all my images and realize that there was this reddish hue to all of them. Um, mm -hmm. And then I finally figured out it's because I had the wrong camera attached. Uh, oh no! So yeah, that's <laughs> kind of how it started out. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, yeah, I've, I've seen the no IR Lessons camera. Learned. Actually, I feel like that's one of the pieces of equipment that I looked at, but I, I haven't actually bought. Um, just because, like you said, it's specialized. If you have a low light application, um, that's that's the thing that you would want to buy. Uh, but what was what was your original project that you were going to do with this no IR camera? Yeah, it was um, just a, another kind of simple but uh, obvious, I think, IoT project using a Raspberry Pi to help understand whether or not my garage door has been left open or closed. Um, it seems oh. to be common enough, not just with me, but my neighbors, um, and to also control it. But uh, yeah, that was that was the project. I'm sure that that resonates with a lot of people, uh, not just your neighbors, but probably a lot of our viewers. Um, how's that project coming? That one's a bit of a disaster. Um, my wife ended up asking <laughs> me to take it down because it was breaking things. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a fun fact about those new IR cameras. If you really want to get use of it, uh, I think we have a, we should have a video of this as well. Uh, not a lot of people know, but if you're trying to debug some kind of infrared project, uh, you can use one of these cameras that doesn't have an IR filter or even some older Android phones. You can point the mm -hmm. camera at your remote. And as you see here, oh. I push the button and the LED blinks. Now I've shown videos like this. I should have done a side-by-side -side video. You cannot see that that 
light normally. It does not look like anything to your to your eye. But if you're using something like the no IR camera, or in this case, I was using a webcam that didn't have uh, an IR filter on it, uh, you can see that. So if you've got a broken remote and you want to make sure it's actually working, uh, you can point it at the camera, press a button, and uh, help debug your IR projects. I use that all the time when I'm working with infrared. That that's, sounds that's amazing because awesome, I can imagine batteries die or someone just borrows the batteries and you don't know, and it's hard to debug if it's just a battery yes, problem. children like, love to really borrow broken. batteries and then complain <laughs> that the remote doesn't work. And then it's, yeah, so good, good pro tip there. <laughs> okay, yeah, so now you've, <laughs> yeah, you've just a cool story. Yeah, it's true. Great story, Tim. Um, all right, so now you've realized maybe the no IR camera is not right for you and you move to the Raspberry Pi camera. Um, what are the other challenges that you ran into now that you have this new camera? Uh, you're taking pictures that are like pretty close, right? So they're only a few inches away. Yeah, that's right. So um, that was the next challenge was once I switched to the, the more standard Raspberry uh, Pi camera, the, the V2 um, camera module for Raspberry Pi, um, it does really well in general settings of taking, um, you know, more generic uh, stills a little further away. But when you actually get the camera into a, a very close setting where you're either only a, a few inches away from your uh, target or, you know, within a foot of what you're trying to take photos of, it actually mm -hmm. brought about challenges that I hadn't dealt with before and learning how to focus the camera. Um, we're also accustomed with our cell phones and, and digital zoom lenses that we have today uh, that going mm -hmm. through the rigmarole of having to understand how to apply the focus here um, took a little bit uh, of, of practice to actually get down. Oh yeah, so um, how long did it actually take you to adjust the camera focus? Cause like, your computer is in one room, but everything's out on your screened in porch. And so that's where all the physical equipment is. So like, how did that, how long did that take to adjust? Yeah, honestly, more time than I'd, I'd care to admit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it did, <laughs> it did take some, some running back and forth. And uh, at first I was doing exactly what you just described. I was going out, uh, tuning the, the lens just a little bit because they give you this little yeah. plastic um, thing that's used to to adjust the focus. Um, running out mm -hmm. there, tuning it, taking a picture, coming back in and, and looking at that again um, until I finally figured out, all right, this is just going to be faster to bring inside and uh, go ahead and hook it up to a monitor and adjust the, the lens that way. Um, again, just holding something very close to the lens to make sure that you know the zoom and the focus and all that looked good. I probably cool. would have gone through that same pro progression <laughs> of like oh, yeah. doing it here and then running out there and then coming back. Uh, and probably Very common with lots of lot physical longer. projects. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, you've got something on the other side of the house and yeah, I don't know, for whatever reason, every time I start a project, I never think I should just move my laptop right next to where I need to do this. <laughs> Instead, I'm up and down the stairs all the time. So I feel your pain there. Um, <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that you used EC2 for this. I'm curious, what made you what made you choose EC2 to, to do the encoding of the time-lapse videos? Yeah, part of that was um, just kind of the, the easiest way, in my opinion, to get up and running, simply because FFmpeg as a command line utility was new to me. Um, I was using that on my own laptop, on my on my MacBook. And then from there, mm -hmm. it was just easiest to transfer what I had there as a kind of working bash script into an EC2 instance to see if I could replicate what I'd built there. Um, and then I did some exploration into whether or not I could do this with Lambda in a serverless architecture. Uh, but at the time, there is an open source library out there to support an FFmpeg layer in Lambda, but I, I just went with what worked um, right out of the gate. It just was kind of the easiest uh, just works option again. Got it. And if you've got a lot yeah. of big pictures, you probably you can't copy them all into temp. You run out of space or something. I I know that it exists now. Maybe it didn't exist when you started the project, but there is now EFS support. So it might be interesting to see if you could then move this over to Lambda and see if it works works the same way for you. Yeah, definitely. That's a that's a great point, Tim. Is um, even as you accumulate enough images over time, plus you're generating um, on the local disk. Uh, and a, I'm not an expert in dealing with media or anything like that. So maybe there's some some cool options to do that, like you mentioned with EFS and Lambda.
Uh, so uh, what kind of computer vision or motion detection did you use to make sure that your pictures were ex like acceptable? So I had all sorts of, I'll say, delusions of grandeur here um, <laughs> as to what I was going to do. Uh, Welcome to the so, club. That happens to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the first problem I ran into was really that I just scheduled it to take uh, the Raspberry Pi to take n photos every 15 minutes without consideration that at nighttime, I wasn't really going to see anything. So I had to deal with all of these stills um, that were completely pitch black. There's nothing that you could uh, visualize in there at all. So what I figured out after just a little bit of, of kind of thinking through how I might solve this problem uh, with something fancy, like training a, a custom model or something like that in mm -hmm. SageMaker with machine vision and all that, I just figured out, oh, uh, I actually know what time the sun rises and the sun sets. So I can just stop taking pictures uh, 15 minutes after and 15 minutes before um, which then gets us out of the business of having to figure out this this other problem. And I think that kind of answers a question from one of our viewers, D3 underscore 3P, curious about your Lambda function. How do you determine when to take pictures? So it sounds like you do it by when you know sunrise and sunset. Yes, yeah, exactly. And uh, in addition to that, it's just a very simple, um, almost cron job in Python, uh, just using a, a cron schedule to take a picture every 15 minutes. It's really rudimentary. Um, so it's configurable. And what's nice about with Greengrass is if I want to change that, I could update the, the function and deploy the changes down to the Greengrass device. And, you know, my, uh, my schedule has changed. Cool. Love it. So yeah, when I first how... heard that you were... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, when I first heard that you were doing this, I, I think uh, we both probably totally overthought this. I was like, how are you going to detect? What are you going to do to detect <laughs> that it's nighttime? And what are you going to, you know, is there going to be some fancy filter that you're going to run? Or, you know, is there going to look at the luminance channel? And I, I came up with all these crazy things. And then uh, this elegant, simple solution of, uh, you know, when the sun rises and sets, like, that's, that is perfect. I probably would have spent a long time working on that until I realized, like, there's just a formula to do this. So I think that's really cool. This, <laughs> having these uh, simple simple solution wins for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, always. I agree. <laughs> I agree. And, and so, that's where my mind went yeah. to, Tim, with, uh, with everything that we have available to us and thinking through IoT problems like that. Um, that's definitely where I went. But you're right. Simple solution is often the best one. Um, so you set your Lambda to go to take pictures every 15 minutes when the sun is up. What about um, the EC2 and the generation of your time-lapse videos? How often does that happen? Yeah, so <clears throat> that I just scheduled, uh, again, using a cron job on EC2 to wake up once an hour. That seemed to be, mm -hmm. after experimenting with it, the right frequency to, to regenerate those because mm -hmm. you're really only getting four new frames an hour. And I think the video parameters were generating something like uh, 10 frames per second. So it wouldn't even be noticeable, even generating it once an hour uh, to have an updated video file. Hmm. OK. And when you generate the video file, you drop it in the same place as the previous one. You just overwrite them. So every time your kids refresh, you said you get the, the latest and greatest video, right? Yep, that's right. Just right back onto a, a well-known S3 key. Right. But what if you want to see you, like a previous video? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. If you, <laughs> yeah. what are you going to do then? What's nice is since you're also generating all of the stills, and because of the mm -hmm. naming convention I was using for the keys to store each of the still photos, um, I could just use a simple formula to generate a uh, time lapse for a given range of photos that were taken. I didn't even have to maintain that information in a database. Um, so it was, it was just very easy to do that way. Um, so did you cool. um, have any fancy logic to change the way or when you would take pictures? No, not yet. Um, there is something that I am experimenting with right now. Uh, the AWS recognition service just recently uh, released a new feature called custom labeling. And that would allow me to take my still photos and to use recognition to train wow, it cool. to understand That's when the chrysalis is transitioning. Um, so today, you'll notice in the pictures that we're, we're 
put up on the screen earlier, the nice beautiful green goes into uh, more of a uh, dark color right before the butterfly is about to emerge. And so the idea is to train recognition using custom labeling to first recognize the chrysalis and then to understand that it's nearing the end of the chrysalis phase to then get into this automated approach that as we take these still photos, we can say, hey, the, the butterfly is likely going to emerge probably tomorrow morning. And they always emerge bright and early in the morning. Um, so at that oh, point, beautiful picture. then, yeah, yeah, they are, they're just beautiful. It makes us smile every time we see them. Um, so yeah, when they, when they do emerge, the idea would be to go ahead and also start recording a video, um, of the emergence and to upload that to S3. So that's kind of a work in progress right now using recognition for that. That is so cool. Um, so do you know about the impact that your project's been having or has had on the, uh, population of the monarch butterflies in your area? Yeah, actually, this would be a great opportunity to, to bring on my wife, Sarah, um, to talk about that. Bring on Sarah. Sarah on the spot. Hi, guys. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. Hey. Thank you. I honestly can say that we have been doing a pretty big impact. Uh, I've had many people in different states and a lot of friends locally that have been really into wanting to start their own butterfly garden and at least 12 people just i mean just around here and it's been really great to see how many butterflies they're able to release and how successful it's been that is amazing Yeah, Sarah, how many butterflies would you say that we've actually uh, released into the wild at this point? Probably about 75. I know oh, wow. we've had more than that. Yeah, we've had more than that, but we've we've definitely released about 75. And one actually um, emerged this morning. It's like at <gasps> new. You can see it right there. You see it? Special, special. Oh, see. Yes. I know. That's cool. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Unexpected um, cameo. It's like. Yeah. I know. That's what I, I, I walked out. And I was like, oh my gosh, one came out. This is awesome. <laughs> um, so we, we've released about 75. Um, I, David can attest to this, but I do a little bit more than I should. So I had a ton <laughs> of caterpillars that I had to get rid of, um, not get rid of, but I had a lot of friends. That's how I made uh, some new friends around here. Um, we've you given away what. Well, Yes, rehomed them. That's a good term. Um, we have rehomed well over a hundred <laughs> caterpillars in oh, various wow. stages. Wow. Yeah, um, and all of them, I think, pretty much all of them, but like maybe a couple handful didn't make it to the butterfly stage. Um, so it's been it's been really cool to see, and I have to keep up with my milkweed and and just getting all the butterflies. <laughs> I was just going to say, how long do you have to wait till you let this new one out? I assume not great weather outside, but is there any time, period of time no, you have to wait before? It actually, no, yeah, it just, it just rained. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the ideal time frame, they don't, they have to dry their wings. So that can okay. be between two to four hours, depending if you have them inside or outside if it's humid or, you know, all the different factors. So um, once they start flapping their wings a lot um, and they seem to be fluttering around pretty well, because once we keep it in the cages right now, the enclosures, and then when they start moving around, they start flapping their wings a little bit more, then we'll take them out. And the kids love to like let them crawl all over them and like hang out. Um, and then we let them hang. Can you see the screens? So we let them hang on our screens. And once they like start fluttering around more, that that's when you know they're they're good to go. You just can't do it when it's raining because they can't fly when it's raining. So yeah. um, we'll probably release this one later today. Cool. Once the kids well, have glad, a chance. I'm glad to, I got like, on the show. That, that's the important part. I know. How cool, right? <laughs> like, Did you tell it so it had cool. to come out today? <laughs> I mean, talking to it last night, I'm like, hey, you know, if you want to be kind of famous here, you need to make it happen. So, yeah. 
<laughs> How long have you been doing this? Oh my gosh. So I'm a newbie, actually. I started in March, um, right before oh. COVID hit and everything started closing down. I am a part of different gardening groups on um, various social websites. And I just was all about like, the butterflies and I love the idea of having um, more native plants around and just seeing all the different butterflies. So I just bought a couple plants and I honestly learned as I went, I learned like what an egg was, like what the stages are. There's five instar stages to the caterpillars. Um, I'm now more recently learning about all the different diseases um, that can mm. happen and which is one of the big reasons why we brought them in. Um, I did in one of my groups, I heard that like less than 3% make it in the wild. And oh, wow. I mean, yeah, less than 3%. And it's just like, if we can help just a little bit and they are, um, I mean, this is, this is important stuff. So I feel, I feel pretty good about it, but yeah, trying to make sure that the diseases that we have, you know, don't get them or um, there's different animals that can infect them. So we're trying our best. That's an amazing amount. 75 in five months is incredible. <laughs> I would have had more. I honestly would have had more if I had more milkweed. <laughs> That's why we want to give away so many. You have to stock up. Uh, we I have know. a question from you, Pooley. Um, have you ever named any of them? Yes. Um, Oh, I so my our middle child uh, named mm -hmm. our very first one Orange. Very original, I know, <laughs> but she she named it Orange, um, and um, another one was called Lovey. Um, it's really just the girls that I mean they're eight and three, so they my son just is like doesn't care about naming them, but they love. Um, playing with, not playing, but, you know, holding them and talking to them and naming them. And, but those are the, the two main names that they keep reusing is Orange and Lovey. So you said now you're looking for um, figuring out how to identify these, um, I guess, the, the diseases. So what's next for you? So I bought um, on Amazon, go figure, uh, these uh, little microscopes that you can test for, there's an OE parasite. Um, you can test them when, once they've hatched, you check underneath their abdomen and you um, test them under the microscope. Um, there's a way to do that. And then you can see if it's a healthy butterfly or not. Like I'll be doing this one once it is um, dried a little bit more. Um, because the scales and everything has to fully come out and, and fully dry. Um, so I will be doing more testing for that. Um, and then just trying to keep that healthy butterflies going. <laughs> yeah. And as, as That's part of that, cool. um, I, my sister is actually a high school biology teacher and I reached out mm -hmm. to her to ask about, better microscopes for Sarah. So spoiler alert, this is a whole Sarah's family birthday is affair. coming up. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Happy birthday, Sarah. <laughs> I know, I'm so excited, thank you. I'm so excited. I honestly didn't think he'd be all on board for this, but I'm very happy that he was getting into my new obsession and, and hobby. So throw some IT stuff in there and he's good to go, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what's so, yeah, the next the IT stuff that you're gonna be doing? Yeah, with um, some of these microscopes that they have now, um, you have some some nice attachments to then be able to attach your phone uh, to the microscope lens. So the idea would be to get one of these for Sarah for her birthday. Um, so I just spoiled her birthday present. Uh, but <laughs> to then use that I'm again excited. with uh, recognitions, <laughs> custom labels support to hopefully help uh, look at these these disease patterns versus the um, mm -hmm. undiseased patterns uh, that we're capturing with the with the butterflies um, to make sure that we're only releasing healthy species into the population and you know not potentially having a, a negative impact. So yeah, this this diagram here also talks about that. So how we would upload pictures again using uh, green grass into S3, but now also use uh, as photos are uploaded 
trigger a Lambda function that then uh, runs across recognition and tries to detect whether or not uh, the, the specimen that we've captured is, um, is infected or not. I cannot wait okay, for that cool. too. That'll be so <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, this is the custom labels feature you said you were gonna do. You're gonna get a bunch of images training against that generate custom labels, right? Yep, that's right. Yep, that's the uh, the newer feature in recognition, custom labels. Yeah, awesome. I haven't tried it. I'm, I can't wait to see the results from this. It's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. Yeah, what's nice about custom labels is even just to get started, it provides um, a nice user interface that makes it very easy to go in and create the labels, the bounding boxes around what you're trying to train it for. And even just passing in a few images to begin with, um, it seemed to, to understand, you know, and I'm talking about tens of images versus the hundreds or thousands of images um, that, you know, I would have expected to have to generate. Um, within a few images, recognition was able to, to begin understanding and recognizing what we we're looking for. That's amazing. Uh, I'm just getting to know about machine learning and they always say, you know, oh yeah, we have a small data set, just a, a few hundred thousand, <laughs> which still seems kind of big to me. Um, so it's cool to hear that recognition just take 10, can take tens of samples and still res return a result that's useful. Yeah, when you've got to label those images and draw the boxes yourselves, the fact that it can do it with so few images uh, makes me really hopeful. I got to try out custom labels on C. Uh, there's a few projects that I wanted to do in the past that I was like, I can't label 10,000 images. It's just too much. Um, but this recognition custom labels may, may fix it for me. So thanks for letting us know about that. Yeah. Tim, isn't that what kids are for? <laughs> <laughs> I think they would get too bored unless I could turn it into a video <laughs> game, which could actually be an entire business, uh, like on Mechanical Turk or mm -hmm. something. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, guess the takeaway here is that um, your project, Sarah, is kind of helping push innovation and new ideas um, for David to help you out with and for you to both to work together. So it's really cool that um, your project of learning more about butterflies has kind of gotten David to think about how can we use technology to, uh, to, to help you out and help out the monarch butterfly population. It's really cool. It is really cool. And I'm just really happy that he got involved because we got to see really cool things. So it's been really great. <laughs> great. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you both. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sarah, for coming on the show and telling us all about your really cool project. Thank you yeah, for thank having you. us. Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was super cool. So, I learned a lot, and I'm really very cool. excited about Me getting too. started with uh, recognition again, which uh, I think I used for the first time last week in a in a full blown project, and uh, or two weeks ago, and now I'm going to get to try it again. Yeah, and it sounds like I mean maybe you can try it with your bird spy project that you started last week. Ah, uh, good point. Yeah, I got a lot of things yeah. that I would do now that I know the custom labels are there. So I'm this this <laughs> might inspire a future show. We'll see. This is my impression of Tim plotting. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so I think it's time for all the tricks. Yes. All yeah. the tricks. So Tim and I both go to a lot of conventions and we end up having boxes of hardware from years of going to these things and picking up cool new boards and peripherals. I mean, what about you, Tim? Oh yeah, I have, uh, I don't want to turn the camera around because it would probably terrify people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's just yeah. a pile of things that I have here, including the closet that I have full of stuff and the other room that I have full of stuff. Uh, yeah, I've been accumulating this kind of stuff for years and years and years. And um, it's always challenging for me to figure out where to take it, what, what to do with it. I don't want to just toss yeah. it in garbage. Maybe somebody else could use it, but never really sure what to do with it. Yeah, and I'm always worried about throwing it out because you don't know how much like putting lead and mercury and other kind of toxic toxic substances just in the ground and in, um, in the landfill but so we looked up depending on where you live 
uh, you usually can e there's usually either a public or private offerings to recycle, remanufacture, or uh, reuse these unwanted electronics. So, for example, Washington State runs a program, um, and we have a URL for it, and it claims that only 2% of the material that it collects actually ends up making it to the landfill. And it makes every effort to uh, avoid uh, sending material to countries with weak ha uh, hazardous waste handling. Um, so there's a uh, that Washington state, um, but also New York, where both Tim and I live, um, has similar programs. Um, so in New York State, you can there. Um, there's a web page which we also have a link to that um, you can look up your county, and there are actually drop off places where you can go and drop off your electronics or um, like your laptops or monitors or extra IoT boards like. Tim and I are hoarding. Um, yep. <laughs> and so uh, look for your local state and county programs. They usually follow the EPA uh, or similar guidelines, and they tend to be very transparent um, about what they can do uh, and their impact, at least in the US. And um, they publish reports on, on their where their materials end up. So take a look at those links, share in the chat stream. Also, awesome. it's yeah, also so... possible. Oh, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, it's possible to buy up older stuff. So if you're just trying to experiment, um, you can go to Facebook or uh, I guess Facebook uh, Marketplace or Amazon or even Craigslist to see maybe there's hardware that you could just reuse. Yeah, awesome. So recycling no longer needs to be a challenge. It was difficult for me. I had a place that I could go to as far away, but I, I don't need to worry about that anymore. I can look up these uh, resources and find a closer place. And like you said, make sure that it's actually getting recycled, which is great. Speaking of challenges, yeah. time for the challenge of the thing of things this week. Challenge of the this things. Week, there we go. This week's challenge of things. <laughs> um, based on what Dave showed us today, uh, we're curious mm -hmm. if anybody has a design or could come up with a design to convert images into still images into um, a time lapse sequence using Lambda. Easy enough to do it with EC2 and FFmpeg, but maybe you can use Elastic Transcoder or Media Convert or some other managed service uh, to be able to do it. So if you've got an idea on how to do it, uh, no matter how crazy it is, uh, please uh, uh, tweet us at um, the hashtag all the experiments and uh, let us know what you've done. We would love to learn a new way to do that. And um, yeah. I think that's it for this week. Yes, so, uh, that is it for this week. Yeah, check the chat stream for the resources that we talked about this mm -hmm. episode. I know I've been saying it for weeks now, um, but we have everything set up to get the assets out. So now we're going to be doing them in stages. We're going to release the, mm -hmm. the bobblehead assets and then each episode assets um, hopefully next week. So uh, look for those and we'll, uh, we'll tell everybody about them in the next show. And be sure to tune in to our ne next episode in two weeks. Uh, September 3rd, it's a Thursday, so watch for announcements. Uh, we're going to be looking for projects and uh, app projects and experiments uh, from the edge to the cloud. Uh, so send us all your cool ideas. Lately, I've been into motors. I'd love to see any of the innovative projects that you've been using with uh, motors and IoT. Um, so let us know what you thought of the show uh, at hashtag all the experiments on Twitter. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time on IoT All the Things. All the Things Special Projects Edition.